Right. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this high-level event on the um, EC's new adaptation strategy. Launched yesterday, hot off the press. Um, my name is Paul Watkiss. I'm going to be your moderator for this afternoon. And I think we've got a really interesting session. We've got some fantastic speakers uh, and I'm sure you all have a lot of questions. Um, I guess if we were honest, we would have loved to hold this in Brussels. Um, it's funny to think that a year ago that we'd be sitting here and saying how much we're all missing Brussels, all of those of us from outside, but that's certainly the case. But, uh, you know, things are working well on the virtual world now. So we're going to run through uh, and let me just give you an overview of this afternoon. Um, I'll say a few words of introduction. Um, after that, we are going to go to each of our panelists in turn and they will give us um, a short presentation um, highlighting some key aspects from the strategy. Um, we're then going to have a round of reflection. We'll ask each of them if they want to raise or highlight any points from the things that other people have said, and perhaps I'll pick up one or two points that I'll ask them with respect to the strategy. And then we're going to go to an open question and answer session. So that's the audience, that's your opportunity to um, contribute, ask questions, easy questions, difficult questions. Um, and what you can do is you can go to the Q&A function that should be on your screen. Um, you can sub sub submit some questions. Uh, and we will collate those together and ask them back to the participants, probably collating a few areas of interest together uh, and sharing the question round to all the participants as well. Um, and then we'll due to finish um, at uh, um, six o'clock uh, uh, and um, we'll finish on time. So um, a quick introduction from myself. I asked the organisers what they would like me to say and they said, um, can you be inspirational? And I said, I don't think so. And I don't think I can do that, especially in the middle of a global pandemic. So, you know, it's difficult. Um, what I can do is just give a couple of reflections and I can set the scene a little bit for the strategy. So the reflection is this, I suppose. Um, I've been working on adaptation for about 20 years. And when I started, there were people who had themselves already been working on adaptation for 20 years. So this is an area that isn't new. There's 30 to 40 years of experience here. And I think one of the things that also allows us to do is to look back. Um, for those of you who know, when we do our climate modeling, we always pick a future time period. And in the old days, the time period we always picked was the 2020s. That's now. So we're sort of living through our own projections, which is quite an interesting thing to do. And it also means we can sort of look back and mark our own homework. Uh, have we ended up where we thought we would? Now, you know, uh, I don't want to congratulate the climate modelers too much, but, you know, they said we would have a, a degree of climate change relative to pre-industrial by now, and that's happened. Um, you know, we don't want to congratulate them too much, otherwise they'll be unbearable and, and, and never let us forget it. But, you know, what we have um, projected has started to occur. And we see that on the impacts and the adaptation, uh, impacts and economic cost side as well. You know, we're starting to see the impacts that were projected, if anything, things are worse because of the extreme events that are starting to arise. And, and looking forward, certainly our, uh, our projections are much more pessimistic perhaps than we were. But it's when we come to adaptation that I think it's really interesting. Um, if I'm honest, we always projected that we would be doing much more adaptation than we are. You know, people are starting to adapt reactively, that's starting to happen. But to date, and maybe this is outside Europe, but certainly not as much planned adaptation as we thought. You know, our models said adaptation is very cost effective. There'll be no dumb farmers um, and we haven't really seen the uptake. Now, I think that's where the European Commission comes in and where the adaptation strategy comes in, because um, what we know is that adaptation is challenging. It's not a technical solution. It's a process. And um, there's lots of barriers and constraints there. So we need some help. Uh, and I think the Commission led the way really in 2013 with the first adaptation strategy. And now we're at a sort of another turning point or pivot point where we're looking forward to the next 30 years and looking at what's going to take us forward to 2050. So I suppose uh, the other thing that really is important to highlight is thinking about when and where it's appropriate for Commission adaptation policy as opposed to other people doing adaptation. Um, it's always important when we look at an adaptation strategy to think about subsidiarity, subsidiarity and think what's appropriate at member state level or local level for adaptation. Um, and I think the other thing that we have seen, which I think really comes to the point of the adaptation strategy, um, 
we can ask government to help us in adaptation in two ways. They can um, do direct interventions and actually help do adaptation for us, or they can create the enabling environment for us to adapt. And that's really important because we know that adaptation involves lots of barriers and constraints, market failures or policy or governance failures or behavioral barriers. And I think um, my first point about the uh, EC adaptation strategy is it recognizes that and it's creating the enabling environment for everyone else to adapt as well as for the commission to adapt. And I think, you know, I think it does that really well. And one of the things that you'll see throughout the strategy is that focus on creating the enabling environment. And I think all of our panelists are going to talk about different elements of that this afternoon. And I think the second thing that I just want to highlight is I think we all want to look at the adaptation strategy and see a bold ambition. You know, that's what we all would really like. And it has it. I, it has a really bold ambition about 2050 and being a climate resilient society. Um, and I think it starts to and ask us to do things in a different way. So with the mission based approach, we are actually trying to repivot and try and think about adaptation in a way that's more transformative, um, which is a really different way of doing it. And I think if you put those two things together, you sort of see the way and the direction that the strategy is going in. It's creating an enabling environment for a major pivot towards a mission based approach. So I think it does that really well. Um, we're going to hear about that now from our panelists over the next couple of minutes. I guess the only thing I want to just highlight is that um, in 30 years time, we will be in 2050 and we'll be able to look back and see if the projections we made around now are uh, or have appeared to come true in terms of what's happening. So um, I think we'll only know what's happening in the future, but I think the adaptation strategy is a great start to put it along that pathway towards a different way of thinking um, towards a 2050 resilient society. So that's my opening. I wanted to just get that across. I think um, we have a very interesting set of panelists. What I'm going to do is I will introduce each of them in turn uh, and they're going to give us a, 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 a high level um, intervention, um, mostly with slides, I think. Um, and then after we've gone around and heard from those presentations, we'll take a little bit of stock and ask um, the panelists perhaps to reflect. And then we'll go to the question and answer session. So please um, put in your questions and answers as we go through. Um, what I would like to do now is start our panelists and we'll go through the order that we have um, on the agenda. So our first speaker really needs no introduction, although I will introduce her anyway. Um, it's Elena, Elena uh, Wisna uh, Mananoska, uh, Head of um, uh, Adaptation at DG Klima. Um, Elena is a passionate uh, adaptation champion. I think that's really fantastic. I suspect she's also quite relieved having seen the strategy go out yesterday. Um, so I, I look very much forward to her intervention. Um, and Elena, I'm going to hand over to you now to talk us through some of the key points of the strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, it's really a pleasure to listen to you, Paul, and to uh, get all these uh, flowers, uh, be it on the bold ambition, on the enabling environment, uh, and uh, actually on a different way of, of doing policy. And that was really our approach to, to make this new adaptation uh, strategy a groundbreaking, a, a very inclusive process also internally in the Commission. And the proof of it is that I have my colleagues here from the co other Commission departments. It's not just an internal uh, DG Klima undertaking, but uh, all colleagues who are around the table substantially contributed uh, to this ambition. Now, allow me to put uh, up uh, a couple of slides, of course, uh, so that uh, I, I get it uh, started. Uh, and uh, yes, here indeed, we move away from, from a logic that we see from some criticism now of the adaptation strategy, which is about banning and bashing, but it's, it's really to provide a, a bold vision 
which equips uh, Europe uh, to take a stand against climate impact. And we see them already happening as opposed to uh, the uh, situation 10 years ago when we, we could, you know, guess this would come uh, to, to our doorsteps, but they are now here for everyone uh, to see and they hit uh, the media. So you have already uh, introduced the, the vision that will accompany the, the climate neutrality vision that I think already permeated in our DNA. It is recognized by our partners. But as my boss has said yesterday, even if Europe, uh, you know, gets it right and we become a completely climate neutral uh, continent, without the others, we will still bear the, the, the brunt of, of climate uh, change uh, in, at our uh, doorstep. So what is important is that this vision uh, has to be put in place as of now it's not the 2050 and we wait until uh, until we are there in in 2050 but we start uh, implementing uh, the this vision through uh, four main objectives and this is to get smarter on adaptation, so improve really the knowledge and manage uncertainty, uh, act despite the uncertainty, more systemic adaptation, so supporting policy developments at all levels and across all sectors, and getting really swifter and faster on speeding up adaptation across the board. And of course, we have married our European ambition with international action and restore uh, restoring this broken link, as I call it, between uh, what uh, happens outside Europe and how it impacts actually uh, through the different, uh, you know, uh, systems, value chains uh, to uh, on, on our livelihoods, uh, assets, people, economies here. So what does it mean uh, to make adaptation smarter? I mean, first of all, uh, knowing is the basis of everything, but we need to count also on uncertainty. And what we want to do is to push the frontiers of knowledge on adaptation as much as we can, which means that if I am a farmer, I know I have at my disposal drought resistant crops or if I am an operator who is desperately reliant on uh, uh, projections, if I am a business who needs to invest, I have the necessary tools uh, to act accordingly. We need also more and better climate related risk and losses data. And this is exactly for me as a house owner to know what's the history of my house and what is there to, to stay uh, in the future for my children as a legacy. And it is also to make uh, the existing uh, climate adapt that is already a precious repository of activities and options to act a really authoritative European platform for adaptation knowledge, where everyone can come in and, and find the example, find the practice that he or she needs for business, for community, for city. Making adaptation more systemic uh, means that we really uh, bring adaptation from the local level to a more global level. And, and we do uh, so by improving uh, the adaptation strategies and plans that already exist with the granular data we will get from being smarter and fostering local individual or just resilience. So far, we have spoken mostly about regions, about cities, but what about individual resilience? What about the workers who have uh, to withstand uh, the uh, impact in the outdoor um, activities? What about the regions that very much depend on sectors uh, that are uh, vulnerable to climate, be it tourism or agriculture? Uh, we also want to start a very important conversation, and this conversation is with the Treasury Ministries about 
how the cost of disasters or of climate risks actually affects the, the budget and the fiscal frameworks. Uh, the economy doesn't exist in isolation with the uh, planetary limitations and with the risks that come uh, from, uh, from uh, climate or from environmental degradation. And of course, we want to promote much more nature-based solutions for adaptation because these are really non-regret uh, ways of, uh, of addressing climate risks. So just imagine restoring a wetland, a peatland, a floodplain, you know, it brings much more than the res resilience benefit. It brings uh, the benefit of cleaner air, of, of a buffer uh, against uh, heat, uh, and also aesthetic uh, landscapes, which we shouldn't underestimate. And, and very importantly, uh, also, so for instance, security in a greener city is actually also a safer city. Faster adaptation. What does it mean? We spoke a lot, uh, Paul, you mentioned it, about planning, knowledge, uh, you know, uh, adaptation used to be very much the, the business of academics, but we need to go out of the purely planning exercise or uh, knowledge exercise towards a rollout of, of real adaptation solutions that are there uh, out uh, on our shelf, uh, be it uh, a reinforced uh, bridge, be it uh, a green uh, wall or green roof uh, in a city. And we really hope that the upcoming uh, adaptation plan by the European Investment Bank will help to support such a rollout, as well as the uh, Horizon Europe mission, that is a new way of pulling resources for uh, new uh, adaptation solutions, new governance models um, that will be there to, to help and pull out uh, all of this. And let's not forget also the recovery where we see increasingly in member states plans uh, adaptation coming together with water retention measures or biodiversity as a very credible way of acting on climate adaptation. We need also to reduce climate related risk, we know, uh, and that's why we cooperate very much with uh, Maria and her colleagues on an on EU wide risk assessment, as well as with our infrastructure DGs, we work on climate proofing guidelines that should allow to cover infrastructure developments old or existing and if you look at across the Atlantic what has happened just uh, you know weeks a uh, week ago you would understand how much it is important to equip uh, ourselves with these tools. We should also close the the climate protection gap which is about a share of uninsured losses in the over losses and here we need to continue the conversation we have with insurance with cities and other users on how we can uh, strengthen uh, this uh, protection how we can uh, improve the risk uh, management and how we can roll out innovative products for uh, risk uh, transfers and of course very visible is also availability and sustain sustainability of fresh water mr timmermans uh, said yesterday uh, Yes, maybe mitigating the, the climate crisis may, may sound costly, but what about the cost of losing water? And here it is really important to work across the board on uh, uh, different borders uh, with, between member states and, and, and see how we can work more and better on, on drought management plans, on water allocation or water permitting. Coming to the international action, as we know, uh, what happens at our doorstep will affect us internally and will hit us if we uh, just turn a blind, blind eye. 
we are renewing uh, our relationship on adaptation with our international partners, uh, engaging strongly on uh, allocating resources where necessary on giving priority uh, really to resilience and to just resilience in our um, and in our exchanges. It is also about creating uh, new uh, partnerships and let's not forget also, uh, you know, bringing to uh, the international community our commitment, our national uh, adaptation plan under the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Excellent, thank you ever so much. Oops, I didn't have my video on. Um, that's great. We're not going to go to questions now. We're going to go through each of the panelists in turn. Um, so um, thank you for that overview of the strategy. What we're going to do next is talk, turn to um, a colleague, um, uh, Miss uh, Graznia uh, Piswich, who is in DigiConnect, as I understand, and he's, I'm, I'm assuming, going to talk all about the digital uh, innovation that we're going to see and need um, to deliver the adaptation strategy. Please, over to you. You're um, still on mute at the moment. Okay. Um, can I just check with the organizers that we can unmute that? Excellent. I think this should be working now. It is. We can yes, hear really great. Well. Thanks a lot. Yes, indeed. I, I will talk uh, on behalf of, uh, of DG Connect. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, of course, our DG uh, agrees uh, with the rest of the Commission that, you know, doing everything we can to understand uh, how our climate will evolve uh, over the coming decades is absolutely vital, not only for mitigation policies, but also for uh, building climate res uh, resilience. Uh, in fact, this year, if I'm not mistaken the, the, mistaken, the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, is due to release uh, the latest report on climate change uh, science. And uh, it is apparently due uh, to include an alarming new finding um, that some of our leading climate models are projecting significantly higher levels of warming than uh, what was previously thought likely. And this is largely due to apparently changes in the representation of clouds in these models. Uh, now, there are a number, of, obviously, of policy uh, implications of, of these results, and not least, it means that uh, abrupt irreversible changes in climate uh, that are often called tipping points uh, have become more likely, and our climate adaptation policies must, must take this fact into account. However, we know as well that there remains significant, uncer significant uncertainty, and uh, Ms. Malinowska has referred to uh, the need to manage uncertainty in the results that we obtain. And there is a need to pool human and computational resources to produce climate models with more detail, more accuracy than uh, what is currently possible. Now, this is where uh, DG Connect is stepping in and such a concept is in fact coming together under the European Green Deal. Uh, it is called Destination Earth. Some of you might have uh, called, uh, uh, heard about it. It is a flagship initiative of the European Commission that basically aims to respond to the twin uh, green and uh, digital challenge. Huh? It will develop uh, a very accurate replica of the Earth system with unprecedented amounts of detail. And it will notably help us uh, predict such tipping points much more reliably than it is currently possible. This very high uh, uh, precision uh, digital model of the Earth, as we call it, will be built upon a series of uh, thematic uh, digital twins that are linked to uh, the different um, areas of Earth science. Uh, and these digital twins will then support European climate policies and the green uh, data space objectives, which are also part of the, of the Green Deal policies, and enable both expert but also non-expert users to monitor uh, and simulate Earth system developments, uh, whichever land, marine, atmosphere, biosphere we are talking about, but also human interventions. And thus, they will allow us to understand complex, uh, multi-sectorial environmental challenges. Um, they will also allow us to anticipate potential environmental disasters, for example, and crisis. Uh, 
and allow the development and testing of scenarios that enable more sustainable development, uh, including legislative measures and their implementation. Um, basically, they will do that by seamlessly coupling observation data and simulation models. And the first two digital twins that we will be developing um, in this initiative will deal with weather-driven and geophysical environmental extremes. And then the second one with climate change adaptation, uh, very fittingly to today's panel. Uh, now, to give you a few more details about uh, what Destination Earth uh, will consist of uh, in practice, it will basically have at its core um, a, a platform, an intelligent cloud-based platform, which will link uh, vast amounts of, of data, computing capabilities, digital models, uh, artificial intelligence tools, uh, to allow um, analyzing, simulating and predicting basically continuously uh, in real time, uh, ultimately if possible, the state of the earth uh, and they will offer access to services for um, evidence-based decision making. Yeah? Um, we will use for that uh, vast amounts of data. We will start with uh, geophysical data, mainly coming from Copernicus, uh, from the Copernicus program and Earth Observation program. Uh, but uh, those, those data will be uh, complemented by, by other numerous sources of terrestrial environmental data. Um, we will tap into these massive lakes, data lakes, via terabit networks, pull them together, reinforce at an unprecedented scale uh, the latest modeling, simulation and predictive anal uh, analytics. Uh, for that, we will use the power of the latest supercomputer facilities um, and AI techniques. So it pulls really, this initiative really pulls together many efforts that have been made over the last few years in different areas of, um, uh, of intervention uh, in the digital sphere. Now to do all that, of course, the Commission is not going to do that alone. Uh, we are uh, teaming up with the European Space Agency, the ECMWF, which is the European Centre for Mid-Range Weather Forecasting, and EU METSAT, the, the European Organisation um, for Management of Meteorological uh, Satellites. Now, why is this so important? Um, and I mentioned before uh, uh, managing uncertainty. In fact, Destination Earth and the, the innovation that it will bring is because it is about evidence-based Green Deal policy development and implementation. It will allow us to develop user-centric knowledge uh, to support the objectives of the Green Deal. Um, in that decision makers will be able to act uh, on the likely development of environmental stressors and their final impact on people and the environment, but also to evaluate impact of proposed legislative measures and the effectiveness of their implementation. Uh, different policy services at EU level, but also at, uh, at national level, at local level, uh, and then ultimately uh, the general public, the users, the non-experts, uh, uh, as much as, as uh, expert users, will be empowered to understand, for example, the impacts of future climate change on land use, uh, food security, uh, water resources, uh, what have you. Energy providers will be able to plan for long-term availability of um, weather-dependent renewable energy. And for example, the civil protection sector will be able to test the effectiveness of disaster risk management. Uh, it's all about um, the ease of accessing data and benchmarking models. But, and last but not least, it's about providing user-specific and actionable predictions on pictures of the future. Destination Earth will bring innovation in the inter interaction with expert systems by basically generating actionable knowledge based on transparent models and data uh, and that are tailored according to the specific interests and expertise of users. And this last point, this actionability, this is really a, 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 more, a more detailed uh, uh, reflection. Science is, of course, about building models that are supported by observations for characterizing how systems function in order to predict their future evolution. Huh? With models uh, also increasingly used as policy support tools, the risk of potentially poor modeling uh, practice and decision-making can result in uh, 
trust declining in science-based policy making. Eh? The situation is of course particularly serious in the field of uh, regulatory science dealing with environmental sustainability, which is uh, uh, really the core topic of, of uh, the future digital twins. Modeling of complex systems, of course, can create the illusion of accurate, of accurate predictions about climate or sea level changes and uh, the resulting socioeconomic effects um, uh, decades and even uh, centuries into the future. The risk of un underestimating the role of uncertainty has, of course, serious implications for the use of insights from system analysis uh, applied to complex earth system impact models for policy making. And this ultimately, as I said, has an impact on trust in policies supported by that science. Then a key for the success of Destination Earth as a reliable decision support tool will be the mapping of uncertainties of the underlying models and communicating the resulting quality of predictions to stakeholders in a way that basically enables them, both the experts and non-experts users, to understand the maturity and trustworthiness of those predictions. Huh? This ability of the digital twins to communicate uncertainty in a way that will reveal the quality of the underlying science will really make Europe truly a leader in the quality development and implementation of, of our climate and environmental policies. Huh? Um, so what, what next? Um, this is an initiative that is uh, in the making. Um, it is due to be launched um, this year, uh, depending on uh, on how well we can uh, we can advance. But um, as I mentioned, the first digital twins um, should be available by uh, the end of 2023, and we are in fact looking at completing the full digital twin of the earth uh, by the end of the decade. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Um, I have not prepared any slides because I would have probably just put, you know, maybe a visual of the earth uh, and that's that. Uh, so uh, I hope nevertheless that um, uh, this was uh, clear and I'm happy to take questions uh, later on if there are any. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. I mean, that sounds amazing. It sounds like we're about to enter the matrix. It's, uh, it's quite incredible. Um, I, um, now we're going to change direction. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to move to DG Echo. Uh, and I'd like to invite uh, Miss Maria uh, Bratimark to um, give us a little bit of background with the linkages, I'm sure, about everything from solidarity to building back better uh, and the linkages between the adaptation strategy uh, and disasters. So uh, over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for inviting DG Echo to be represented on this panel. Uh, DG Echo is, of course, the branch of the European Commission that deals with European civil protection and humanitarian aid operations. And we, we welcome very much uh, this renewed focus on adaptation, because it is also a renewed focus on disaster risk management. And uh, before presenting a more the DG ECHO perspective on this new adaptation strategy, where there are many synergies with what we uh, are doing. I want to thank the colleagues from, from DG Klima and other, other parts of the Commission for a very uh, dynamic and participatory preparation of the strategy. So DG ECHO uh, addresses climate change impacts in different parts of the disaster risk management cycle. You probably think of DG ECHO mainly in, in terms of the emergency response side. Uh, there has been a lot of activity over the last year, uh, obviously related to COVID. But what we also do is that we also look at uh, preparedness, we look at prevention, and we um, have extensive dialogues with member states on, on, and with different uh, parts of the Commission on, on risk assessments in order to identify changes to the disaster risk landscape uh, in, in the EU. So uh, this is... Uh, so. This is very, uh, there are many aspects of this adaptation strategy that are very important and what I will present to you a little bit the, uh, um, our approach and you will see how many synergies uh, there are here. Now adaptation is wider than disaster risk management and vice versa, disaster risk management is much wider than uh, climate change adaptation of course because we deal with uh, different types of disasters that, uh, that are not at all climate uh, related, uh, earthquakes, 
um, technological disasters, um, just to mention uh, some. Um, but it's really important in this context to make the most of the synergies between disaster risk management and uh, climate change adaptation and that both uh, this synergy needs to be reinforced and we need to do this at all the different levels and uh, if, for us to be able to uh, build a more climate resilient future uh, together. And this is why we welcome very much uh, the wording in this strategy that the Commission will strengthen climate considerations in the EU disaster prevention and management and at the same time um, work closely with the climate uh, risk assessments, for instance. What we know is that despite the possible maximum efforts made in order to mitigate climate change, uh, at this stage we will still continue to need a well-prepared civil protection systems in the future to deal with the national disasters that are already now changing in intensity and in frequency. And as many speakers before me today here uh, in the afternoon and also in this session, we need to do this now, not just in 2030 or 2050 or, or beyond that. It really, uh, this transition needs to happen here uh, and now. Um, and first I wanted to give you a flavour of the latest uh, developments from the civil protection uh, side. Uh, we have very recently had, uh, there's been an agreement uh, on a new uh, revision of the civil protection, uh, Union Civil Protection Mechanism. Uh, it's a revision that will make it, this upgrade of this mechanism uh, will uh, provide us with a more climate smart, um, up-to-date uh, mechanisms that uh, introduce something called resilience goals that will help to prepare, to give set an objective for preparing the civil protection systems for the future. And uh, there is a focus here on transboundary risk and um, this uh, process uh, will uh, take into consideration different things, the risk assessments, member states risk assessments, um, risk management capabilities, uh, but also a better collection of loss data uh, in order to provide better modelling and, of course, uh, climate change. So uh, you, you recognise many of the components that Elena here uh, presented. So just to, to illustrate that there is a lot of synergies between the processes. Um, what we, as I already mentioned, that uh, uh, in this work that we do on, on providing a better overview of different natural and man-made risks that the EU may face. Uh, climate, we have identified climate change, of course, as a major driver for the changing disaster risk landscape. But there are all other drivers, there's urbanisation, there's uh, environmental degradation, there's technological developments and, um, and a, a changing security landscape as well. And it's important to keep this uh, in mind because uh, the, the climate-related uh, hazards will not happen uh, necessarily by them in isolation because we all know and several U European countries have experienced only in the last year that earthquakes can strike in the middle of pandemics and you still have to prepare and prevent uh, work on preventing climate related hazards. So um, so we need to have a multi-hazard approach and I think from the side of DG ECHO what we can contribute to this process is also to bring this uh, wider disaster risk management approach into the picture. But I referred to how we, we adapt the capacities for, for civil protection and, and this process that we are launching with a new uh, upgraded civil protection mechanism. Uh, but of course it's not enough. We need to put all the possible efforts into adaptation and to prevent disaster and to mitigate the residual effects of, of these disasters that we cannot protect ourselves from or that we cannot build a way through prevention measures. And indeed there are a multitude of actions in this strategy that was presented yesterday that, well, most of them in one way or the other uh, contributes to both or links to both of this uh, disaster uh, risk management strategies and to climate change adaptation. These are, as I was saying, um, partly inter not uh, partly the same. Um, so we need for sure to, inter to identify the right adaptation measures, the right prevention measures. Uh, and we need to, it's important as is stated in the strategy that we need to uh, ensure that we don't create new risks. 
um, without taking into consideration uh, the different climate related risks. And we, we need to reduce existing risks and then we need to know how to deal with the residual risks. Uh, one of, of the key actions, key new actions in terms of systemic adaptation, new more systemic adaptation is to, to look at the uh, macroeconomic aspects. And uh, I believe my colleague from uh, DG Ekfin in an earlier session this afternoon phrased it very well that the importance to address the nexus between disaster risk management and disaster risk financing. And uh, it's important that national fiscal frameworks are ready for to face a future uh, intensification of disasters and uh, a greater need for long perhaps recovery and expensive recovery processes. Uh, and as a basis for this, uh, we need solid disaster risk and, and climate assessments. And this is something that we are addressing with the member states, with our expert uh, groups. Um, and this is an ongoing process. So um, we welcome very much that the adaptation strategy brings forward this cross-sectorial and integrated emphasis uh, linking, for instance, these two uh, angles together, but also addressing uh, other important points like the climate related um, uh, insurance protection gap, uh, where insurance is, is a risk transfer mechanism that can play a very important role in terms of uh, obviously supporting a more uh, resilient um, build back after a, a disaster. Uh, but also to help incentivizing prevention and taking the right uh, taking the right measures. So, so these are uh, very important uh, tasks uh, that have been mentioned, and uh, we are ready to continue to engage across sectors when with member states and stakeholders and international organisations uh, within uh, the context of the Sendai framework, for instance, to to gather best practices and to collect uh, more information uh, to this effect. But taking the right steps goes beyond who will pay for uh, how and when, it also is about what. Uh, and clearly uh, there are again many different um, indications here of, of what will need to happen. And, and one of the most important parts of the strategy is of course the focus on, on the governance of adaptation and, and action at different levels, not the least local levels, because it's at the local level where uh, where uh, local authorities with their local planning needs to decide uh, whether you build in a floodplain uh, or not, uh, or whether you try to retract, remove away from building in, in, in that, those kinds of areas. So it's very important that the, the strategy uh, addresses actions at local level here and without being too prescriptive here. Uh, it's also very important to look at just resilience and to focus on vulnerable groups. This is uh, something else that we're also thinking need are incorporating in these uh, resilience goals, because leaving no behind is also essential for adaptation. Uh, here we also see an important role for improving risk communication, risk awareness and risk literacy. Uh, something that we are intensively uh, discussing as late as this morning with uh, our civil protection uh, um, organizations from across Europe. Another uh, very important component is the, the support for nature-based solutions because we need to identify, there is a lot of uncertainty and we need to identify the best no regret measures um, in order to try to, to uh, mitigate the effects of these climate induced disaster, wh whether it is uh, the purpose is to mitigate floods or to mitigate droughts uh, or, or indeed uh, the forest fires and uh, of course to address uh, food safety. Um, and uh, there is, it's no, very important that we learn. Minute, Sorry, yes, and we need indeed, we need to indeed uh, learn to better uh, measure the co-benefits of these different um, measures. Uh, so that's, that's not another important point. Uh, we also welcome the international angle to this strategy. Uh, and as the European um, Humanitarian Aid Office, we in look in, we're interested in further development of anticipatory uh, preparedness uh, approaches, for instance, in external action. So finally, in conclusion, this adaptation strategy provides for a wide range of actions for the Commission that will keep us all busy in the next couple of years uh, with a 
there is a multitude of benefits in here to link uh, for both for disaster risk management and for adaptation. Uh, but it is indeed uh, very important that all of these adaptation measures is not staying within the commission, but it's something that is done across uh, society uh, in, for us uh, with all different actors involved so that we together can build a climate resilient future. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much. That's, uh, that's um, uh, uh, great to see the connections going and the synergies. Um, I'm going to move straight ahead and ask our next speaker, um, which is um, Philippe Tulkins from DG Research. Uh, I think you have some slides to show us, do you, Philippe? Uh, is that right? Uh, and you're on mute at the moment, so if we can hand over to yeah. you. And um, uh, there was a big focus on research in the strategy. I'm sure you have lots of uh, very interesting new innovative uh, actions for us to, to look at. Yeah, I won't use my slides actually. I, I think it's quite late. People uh, have maybe heard several presentations, so I'll take the risk of improvising and try to complement what uh, the predecessors here have been saying rather than uh, repeating. Uh, but Elena uh, and Grajina um, uh, mentioned that at the source of all this, what you have, you have the science, the knowledge. Uh, if we are talking about climate change, as you said in your introduction, Paul, it's because the scientists have been raising this uh, in the IPCC since, since roughly 30 years, but some have alerted they even before. And, and so the, therefore it's quite obvious that uh, DG Research and Innovation and the massive uh, program Horizon Europe now starting is closely associated to this uh, initiative uh, on um, uh, the strategy on adaptation, which will boost effort. And it is very timely to do this now in the middle of the pandemic, well, middle, I hope it's the end <laughs> of, the, uh, of the pandemic, to show that resilience is absolutely fundamental uh, to be addressed at all level, European, national, regional, local, uh, and, and through the deployment of the policies and the means uh, on, on the activities. And we see here in this panel that we have joined up the policy uh, and the means. And I, I think it's an excellent news also for the research community uh, on adaptation that they see that the IT uh, programs, uh, so the digital Europe, is being mobilized on climate adaptation. So it's not digitization for the purpose of digitizing the world or Europe, at least it's for a purpose. And this is uh, fantastic news and Rajina explained it uh, very well. Destination Earth is a very uh, ambitious uh, program, but that will have to rely also on science and it will take some years to deploy. They have a very ambitious um, timetable uh, to deliver already products by 2023. Let's talk about it in, in, in a few years because I think it's, uh, it's somewhat challenging, but nevertheless, it is good to have this vision to plan the activities and to improve in the modeling, in the communication of the results of the models, in their understanding. We see with the pandemics that understanding model outcomes for uh, confinement, deconfinement is not easy. <laughs> uh, everybody has to learn on it. It is the same for climate modeling. I've been working on climate modeling since my studies, and, and I see the same characteristics, the same issues when communicating the results. And also I wish to say, that modeling is not all. Model is only an approximation of the reality. Whatever your model is, it's always an approximation, which can be coarse or fine or refined, but it's never the perfection. And we should not aim at, at having the perfect model because we will the disaster will <laughs> happen before the model gets perfect. So we need to, uh, and that's what happened on climate mitigation, of course. Uh, it didn't, uh, the models are still not perfect. Uh, and nevertheless, policy action was initiated. Same for adaptation. There's a lot of efforts that need to be done to improve the models, to improve the uh, risk assessments, and the research program at European level will, of course, do that and step up the efforts through the deployment of Horizon um, Europe. But I would like to say that, in my view, the biggest challenge is not only to improve the, the, the knowledge, but to accelerate uh, drastically the uptake. Uh, um, and then I refer to faster uh, uh, adaptation. The uptake of the results is key. The clock is ticking. The damages are there and many solutions are available. Nature-based solutions have, have been uh, recalled here in the presentation by DG Eco, but uh, uh, nature-based solution is just 
what we should have done, been doing since decades, probably. Why did we destroy these ecosystems? <laughs> it's just uh, reinventing the wheel in a way. So it's not very sophisticated. It's not technology, but it shows that we have even lost the knowledge that uh, previously human communities had. This is a quite a tough lesson for uh, our scientists as well, because we have a tendency to develop technologies, technologies, technologies for markets, and we forget that nature offers solutions without technology or that the technology of nature is even better than anything we can produce as human beings. So therefore, uh, the uptake, the testing, the demonstration of solution at, at, at a wider scale and much faster than before is absolutely necessary. If you take um, the usual time scale uh, between the uh, production of research results and their uptake, it can take uh, sometimes several decades. And this is what we wish to address also through uh, the research and innovation program, through innovation actions. And this gives me, of course, the opportunity to uh, bring uh, in the uh, new ways of working uh, uh, on the mission. Uh, Elena uh, kindly referred to the mission on adapt adaptation to climate change in her introduction. So uh, this is one part, small part actually, uh, of the uh, of uh, Horizon Europe, which aims exactly at that: is using existing solution, testing them on the ground at a broader scale, and also contributing with the communities to the transformation of society. Because it's not a few technologies, a few models, a few dikes that will bring us the resilience that we need. It's much more sophisticated. It implies a whole transformation of society in several key sectors, uh, probably in most of the sectors, actually. And that implies a huge effort on research beyond technological research and to test solutions with the people. So it means the engagement of communities, uh, co-creation, uh, involvement of all kinds of actors, not only researchers, but also uh, the public and private uh, uh, entities, the public authorities, of course, and we need to address all the elements of the innovation value change where there are bottlenecks or processes or legislations or issues that slow down our capacity to uh, adapt. And we will learning doing this through the mission uh, that is now in a, uh, in, in a phase where the, the Commission is reflecting with a board of experts, with stakeholders, with the member states, at how to implement uh, concretely the mission. The concept of the mission has been published uh, thanks to the very hard work of Jaroslav Miziak, who is very uh, active in, 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 in this event. Uh, and uh, thanks to the good leadership also of Connie Edegard, the, the chair of the mission board, uh, advising the commission on this initiative. They published their report. I, I, I don't want to uh, go into the detail of the report. If you just Google, a climate resilient Europe, you will find a beautiful report that is gives what we should do. Now, uh, uh, the Commission is reflecting at what we can do <laughs> in, in, the, in the coming years. Uh, we are working a lot with DG Klima uh, 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 on this and with other services in the Commission in an integrated way in order to propose um, uh, by uh, the summer uh, uh, an implementation plan that is credible and that can be implemented uh, with, with a view to having an impact in, uh, in a few years. Uh, I, it's also quite ambitious for a research and innovation rooted program to try to go beyond the traditional research and innovation activities, but we feel that uh, it's really absolutely necessary now and will of course make sure that any synergies with other programs uh, such as uh, Digital Europe, uh, Destination Earth, and other policies in the European Union, such as the cohesion policy, for instance, uh, are duly exploited uh, to, to, to test these solutions on the ground and show that uh, research and innovation has a transformative power that can be uh, used to a greater extent and then further deployed uh, for all the su su successful solutions. Sorry, thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. That was excellent. And um, uh, it worked very well. And I, um, uh, there's so many questions I'm sure we're all going to get on the uh, mission as well as Horizon Europe. 
Um, what I would like to do now is invite our next speaker. So our next speaker is um, Alessandra Zamberi from uh, the, the Joint Research Centre. And I, I'm going to hand over for you. Have you got some slides or are you just going to talk? Slides. Um, so I just have slides. I have slides. Slides are good. We can mix it up. Um, just to confirm, we can see your slides and we can hear you. So um, over Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks also for the invitation to attend, to participate and to speak at this panel. Very nice to be among friends and colleagues. And I'm here today to, to tell you a bit what science has also done, our science has also done to contribute to adaptation strategy and, and what we will do in future. First of all, let me explain what the Joint Research Center is. We are the science and knowledge service of the European Commission. We are about 3,000 scientists working on very many different uh, topics, but uh, with one only mission, which is that to support policy makers, mainly inside the Commission, but also outside the Member States, for better evidence for policies. And I think the adaptation strategy that we are discussing today is an excellent example of how policies are really built on sound results of science. And we are very happy to have worked so closely with Elena, her services, but also other colleagues that have been speaking before me uh, to, to, on, this, on this important topic. What we do at the Joint Research Center on Disaster Risk Management that covers the whole cycle of, of risk and disaster management, we provide, uh, we produce data or we analyze data, we model the data, we, we provide knowledge, we develop knowledge, and we do analysis. Uh, for example, we, we look, we want to, to foresee current and future risk. And we do it with many different uh, deliverables that uh, we produce. For example, here you see our um, prediction for Atlantic hurricane seasons, but also we build the knowledge base. And, uh, and here I'm very happy to, to refer to the collaboration with the colleagues in the framework of the European Commission Disaster Risk Management and Knowledge Center, which is a very important source of uh, scientific results and sound uh, results for many policies, you can visit our website, but you are certainly aware because if you come to this panel on science, you are probably a lot of scientists and collaborating with us. Our next book on science for disaster risk management is going to be launched on the 23rd of March, and it has been drafted with 300, more than 300 experts inside the Council the Commission, and it addresses uh, different topics, but also very important for adaptation. So I invite you to, to read it. And we also manage tools, services that um, help um, understand better the risks and um, manage the risks. Among this, I want to mention a very important one. It was already been uh, mentioned before by Grazina. It is the early warning system of the Copernicus, the components of the uh, Copernicus early, um, uh, sorry, emergency management service that we operate at the Joint Research Center. And very often we refer to this uh, Copernicus service, particularly this one on emergencies, as a reaction tool when, when disasters happen and gives and provides information on how to uh, recover, to rebuild after a disaster or to understand an ongoing disaster. But in fact, there is a very, very important component also for, for, for adaptation. And uh, uh, an example of the link between disaster risk and climate adaptation is the announcement now of the European Drought Observatory through a project financed by the European Parliament, which is called the European Drought Observatory for Resilience and Adaptation. And we look forward to engage with colleagues inside the Commission, but also in the Member States, uh, to better to enhance uh, knowledge on, on drought and therefore on adaptation. But uh, let's go into concrete uh, examples of what uh, the JSC and scientists have been doing because we collaborate with many scientists outside our organization for, for this document that was uh, issued yesterday, this important policy, the adaptation. You have certainly heard about the PESETA, uh, the PESETA study, and you must have heard it in very many different uh, uh, fora and events and policies because uh, the European Green Deal and the adaptation strategy 
are really rooted on the outcome of climate change research. And among this research, certainly Pezeta always played a very important uh, role. We issued recently the fourth implementation of the Pezeta studies that have been conducted. And this uh, first uh, Pezeta study number four, uh, focus on the effects of climate change uh, on Europe, including the cost of inaction, the cost of non-action. And, um, and it also gives indication on how much these effects could be avoided through mitigation and adaptation, including natural-based solutions that we mentioned a minute ago. And already we look forward after I delivered these results that have been taken fully into account in developing the adaptation strategy. We are now going to also work on the EU-wide climate risk assessment. But the, uh, the, the EU adaptation strategy mentioned one important uh, other tool that uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, considered very instrumental to implement the strategy because in the end, as we have already said, we have to bring concrete results and we have to implement what the, the strategy has announced yesterday. And I really want to hear to, to ask all the, the participants to be careful because I'm going to ask for their contribution. The tool I'm referring to is the, the, the Risk Data Hub. And this is a geographic web platform <laughs> with pan-European data and methodologies for, for disaster risk assessment. It is an app where we want to put uh, data for, in, for two models. There are various models that are being developed and there are two which are very important. One linked to prevention, where we look at the various components of the risk, the hazard, exposure, the vulnerability at different scales, also looking at multi-hazard impacts, different geographical scales and administrative units. And this is, um, this is the, the place where we want to uh, answer questions like uh, where have been the, uh, where will be the, the higher impacts due to future events? Uh, what could be lost if these events happen? Which are the, the risk drivers and which vulnerabilities might have a bigger influence on the potential future losses? Therefore, we want to provide robust risk assessment to inform climate change adaptation strategies in this module. And then there is a second module, which is the disaster loss module. Very important to learn from the past. We cannot improve the few in the future if we don't study what has happened in the past and how we can do things differently. And this is a very, very important module for the recovery part of the uh, disaster risk management looking at loss and damage data, looking at the lessons learned, and um, uh, also uh, help implement the SNDI targets on the climate adaptation. Now, why do I ask you to be particularly careful here and attentive? Because we need your help. <laughs> because this is a very important tool. We have been working very hard in collaboration with the other services. DG Echo is fully uh, on board. They are also helping us financing this project. And, and the Klima is, uh, as you can see in the communication, in the adaptation strategy, it is clearly mentioned. So we are serious and we want to make this tool become even more robust and, and that therefore it can really serve not only the commission, but member states, local authorities, regional authorities to do their own assessment and how to best uh, implement actions. Because we said we have to now become practical and do things. But it is not perfect, this tool. And it is not perfect because in spite of all our efforts, the data sets are not enough. You can see here the data sets that are present now in, in, the, in, in the risk data hub. And for example, in the risk analysis module, you can immediately notice the red part, which is predominantly produced by by us, <laughs> by the JRC, we have introduced all the existing open source data, the Bezeta data, the data that we inside the JRC or through the research project financed by uh, the G research or other projects that exist, but we really need to populate with more data. So we will do together with uh, also the colleagues that just spoke, uh, will plea for member states authorities to really 
populate the, the system with the data because this is what we need. Uh, Elena was saying in the beginning, we need knowledge, we need more knowledge, we need better understanding of the risk, we need to uh, understand how to react. And with data, we can model this risk and we can model also how to, uh, to act in future. Therefore, please, um, we are already collaborating with many projects as you see here and many others. And, and this is my last uh, slide, just to say that there is a big interest, as you can see, there is a big interest of uh, public authorities, but also big interest of private, big interest of insurers. They are, of course, have understood fully the, the risk out there, and they want to uh, collaborate with us uh, for, for this project to have better data available for themselves. But also we are collaborating with the, with the World Bank, so there is a big interest into this tool. And uh, yes, it will be as good as the data that it contains. So this is my plea for everybody to collaborate for this. But there will be also other places where we work more closely with the member state for populating the tool. And that's all from me. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. And um, of course, you can't go away, but we'll ask some more questions in a moment. So um, we're going to change the schedule. We're just going to go to our final speaker in a moment. Um, but then just to uh, highlight to all the panelists, we're going to go straight to the question and answer session. So um, it is always difficult to get the questions and answers, but we um, want to make sure we allow time for that. So um, I'd like to now ask our final speaker, uh, Lydia uh, from um, Pierre from the European Parliament. You're going to um, uh, give us our final presentation. And I think that's uh, really great to hear from the Parliament in one of these uh, discussions. So over to you, please. Uh, hello, good afternoon, and thank you very much for for this kind uh, for this kind invitation. Um, it is great; uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here participating in this uh, policy panel about um, a very dear topic to me, which is the uh, new EU adaptation strategy, um, and also to be able to share a bit of uh, what are our views in the Parliament, the strengths and the, the shortcomings of the European action uh, in this regard. So, uh, as I mentioned, this has been a very important uh, topic uh, to me, uh, being the rapporteur uh, of uh, the resolution um, on this uh, subject, um, which was approved last year. And um, as I am both on the environment and uh, economic committees, I always defend the prospective view in which we balance environmental safeguards with economic development. Uh, and so I will not bore you uh, with, uh, with, um, with my talking about the problems for the people and, territory, and the territory. I am pretty sure that all of you are perfectly aware of the struggles, um, such as the deadly heat waves, devastating droughts, the ravishing forest fires, the eroded coastlines or the brutal effects of the ocean uh, warming. Uh, climate change is uh, for some years now uh, taking its toll in Europe and uh, worldwide. Nevertheless, if the impact on people, planet and prosperity um, are already unscapable, it is also true that they are uh, unevenly distributed. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea area, uh, for instance, um, will suffer more from the effects of heat-related human mortality, water restrictions, habitat loss, uh, and forest fires, which have been taking hundreds of lives. Um, and uh, if we think also about the water shortages in the uh, EU that have affected economic activities as agriculture, forestry, aquaculture, tourism, or energy production, and, uh, and shipping. So let me remind you that uh, as, 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 this, as the strategy reminds us that the deadliest disaster of 2019 was the Euro European heat wave with the uh, 2,500 deaths. So the strategy presented yesterday, which I had the opportunity to go uh, through it uh, or to have a quick look on that, uh, has indeed some important strengths and I would like to highlight some of them. The first one is the need to act now 
because halting uh, all greenhouse gas emissions uh, would not would not prevent the climate impacts that are already occurring uh, and the frequency and the severity of climate and weather extreme events is increasing. Um, the second is the growing importance um, of the economic losses given the increased level uh, of, the same no of the same losses. And if we look at the EU every year on average, there are losses above 12 um, billion euros, which exposes the European economy to a global warming of three degrees above uh, pre-industrial levels that could result in an annual loss of 15 times fold, accounting for more than many European countries uh, or the total GDP of many European countries. The third one is that we need more data. And besides more data, we need better data. We cannot improve what we cannot measure. And this is a strong and important line in the strategy. We need a strongly uh, to strongly push uh, for uh, the European, um, um, uh, we, we've, st we've strongly pushed for, 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 this, uh, for this line in the European Parliament's resolution uh, on this uh, matter, uh, more and, and better climate related risk and losses data. Uh, we need more data, better data to improve also the decision making process. And this is very important. If, um, if resilience is about building back better, better than we were before the disruption, but um, we cannot do, do it unless we know exactly where, are, um, where we are, where we want to go. So um, that's the reason uh, I can uh, only welcome the view to promote and support the use of the risk data hub to improve the European climate adaptation strategy. The fourth one is uh, the integration, um, integrating climate resilience in fiscal frameworks. As I said before, I strongly believe in the importance of coordinating efforts and strategies between climate and economic, um, economic and financial fields. The climate risks are increasingly relevant to the success of companies and their profits and also for their sustainability. Uh, their survival and therefore the climate changes can through the economic stresses strongly impact public finances and um, we need to develop ways to uh, measure the potential impact of climate related risks on public finances develop tools and models for climate stress testing and i stand by the proposal that national fiscal frameworks in the eu um, should include climate change and natural disaster fiscal risks. Um, the last, uh, the, the, the last point on 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 this um, on on the main highlights I would like to to underline the importance of is the the local level. Uh, the adaptation will not occur if we forget or neglect the local level strategies and actions. And so I fully fully support the ambition to step up. Uh, planning and implementation of local adaptation uh, and the launch uh, and, and to launch um, the adaptation support facility under the EU covenant of mayors. Um, very briefly uh, to, to, to finalize, let me just uh, highlight also some aspects in which I think the strategy uh, could or should um, have gone further. One is desertification. According to the European Court of Auditors, more than 50% of the total area of some of our countries is at risk of desertification. And if this is not enough uh, to make this a crucial issue for all of us, what will be? Uh, unfortunately, the strategy does not highlight the desertification problems as it should and does not propose targeted measures to this issue. So I, I, I must say that I profoundly regret this. The second one is open data. I highlighted the importance of data, but uh, we must push for open public data agenda. Open data is considered as a non-person specific data that is generated by public authorities or through public fun funding, open to anyone with the possibility of further integration without restrictions. It is free, it is structured and uh, machine readable, and it is available. And so this allows people, companies, and researchers to contribute with, the, with the, their findings 
uh, and uh, to contribute with, with new solutions. Uh, and if the data or climate change is generated through public funded, it should uh, be open to the society. The third one, um, international and global ambition. We need a more clear view uh, on international cooperation and the uh, European agenda on this. What are the EU global go goals and how is Europe pushing for, for them in which, and in, in which global forums? And besides this, I, how do we integrate the adaptation agenda on commercial agreements with other countries? What, uh, we are pushing for reducing carbon footprints, but we should also seek for climate adaptation. And the fourth and last one, financing. We need to be bold on funding the adaptation, particularly to prevent long-term effects such as desertification and coastal erosion. And there is a sizable financing gap for climate resilient investments in Europe. The, stra the strategy rightly acknowledges so. Uh, but for instance, we have a just transition fund for regions lagging in the transition, lagging behind the, or lagging in the, trans the carbon transition. And yet, how can we ign ignore the need for just um, a just adaptation fund for regions that are not even responsible for climate change effects. Um, climate change impacts do, do not stop in countries uh, at countries' borders, nor affect more the countries that pollute the most. And uh, I will conclude by here my remarks. And thank you very much once again for this kind invitation. Thank you ever so much. That was um, thoughtful and insightful. I really, uh, that's, that's good. And also challenging, challenging as well, which is good. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move to a question and answer session and I'll um, try and get these into groups and, and get, get us ready for this. So um, I'm going to ask three questions to start with. There'll be a question for Elena from Sabine and then uh, we had a couple of digital questions that we can perhaps group together. And then I'd like to see if we can unmute Richard Klein because he has a question that I think could apply to all panelists. Um, so Elena, I, the first question was really, um, uh, how will you bring this strategy to the people and create the agency for them to act? Um, so uh, recognizing we need a groundswell of everyone buying into and acting on adaptation. Thank you very much for the question. This is to really recognize and, and we believe that the easy part of the preparation is uh, behind us and the difficult one is, is ahead of us. It, it's in selling uh, the strategy or rather increasing the ownership of, of people for the strategy. But we are not starting uh, from zero. We have uh, already the governance structures uh, from the previous strategy and we have very you know many dialogues going on uh, through the city networks for instance like the uh, covenant of mayors be it the european one or, or the global one we have just launched the climate pact which also comes from my team and where we want to really uh, move the uh, let's say governance from from now cities to individuals and 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 we believe that this awareness raising of impacts that is so concrete and got very concrete in the slogans of the youth movement, if you could uh, follow, you know, uh, I love chocolate, that's why I act on, on climate change, you know, or uh, Richard, uh, I, I spotted your article yesterday in your active on coffee, of course, we all uh, love coffee. So this is how you bring the, 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 the sort of stories to people's doors and, and using the, the different, uh, you know, angles, uh, which will uh, really uh, gain uh, people's hearts if if you wish. We start immediately, of course, with uh, member states. They will be the key implementers of the uh, adaptation strategy and the Portuguese presidency plans to have council conclusions and we would like them to debate it in as many uh, formation of the council, uh, if you want, not only in the environment council, but as, as Lydia also said, we need to bring it to the treasury uh, ministries, to minister responsible for health, uh, consumer protection, protection and, and uh, employment, uh, to research uh, ministries, to agricultural uh, ministries. So uh, the, the time is on, we will do so. And we, of course, use any possibility 
to spread the knowledge about uh, climate adaptation because we very much are aware that uh, you know time is of essence and in climate adaptation everything uh, takes a little bit more uh. thank you ever so much that's great now it's going to take me longer to actually ask the questions um, that were mentioned on the digital side. So I, I'll just pass over and say if you can sort of capture some elements of the three questions that were asked on the uh, on the digital um, elements uh, with respect to human influence, accessibility and infrastructure, that would be wonderful. And then um, Yaro, if we can just see if we can uh, unmute Richard afterwards, that would be good as well. Okay, happy, happy to take the questions. In fact, I, I provided a, a, an element of the answer to the question on access um, for different users in the written form, but I will complement it. So uh, I will just repeat uh, uh, briefly what I said uh, in my written answer for the benefit of everybody. So of course, this, uh, um, you know, how will we um, make Destination Earth accessible for such a uh, wide range of audiences? Obviously, this is absolutely an excellent question and one of the key, key questions. We are uh, already working in the run up to the launch of, of the first part, first phase of the initiative. We are working on access policy and conditions, of course, because uh, resources are limited and it is going to be a big challenge. And uh, as we deploy the initiative gradually, um, we will, you know, scale it up. Uh, we will also scale up uh, the resources such as access to high performance computing resources as we deploy them as well. So this is going to, to help. But another part, and, and that is where I want to complement that answer, is that, um, uh, you know, part of that of that discussion and and that uh, uh, and those access conditions will be categorizations of the user groups in terms of of the resources that they need and that that, that they could usefully um, well that they could use basically for their purposes, and that access policy will uh, will have to be applied to provide the right toolset to the right audience uh, to meet their needs to make sure that there is an efficient management of resources to avoid breaching uh, requirements by abusing uh, uh, the, the SLA requirements or the service level agreement requirements abusing its capabilities uh, to provide um, equivalent equivalent access rights to, to uh, equivalent user groups in order to avoid any data access misalignments, um, to be able to monitor and survey the user satisfaction levels, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So based on the user's sort of subscription registration categorization that will ensue, each user will have access through the core platform to the respective features and capabilities and its own user space. And everyone, in practical terms, everyone will have to log in through the same core platform login process. And then they will be assigned a user category and the, and the respective capabilities will then become available uh, to them for usage. Of course, this means that not everything will have to use the digital twins huh? because uh, due to their size and complexity, the use of digital twins will have practical lim limitations, but there will be a number of options that will going to be provided direct that are, that are going to be provided directly by the platform in terms of analytics and data downloads, visualizations, uh, uh, developer tools, uh, simulations, what have you. So that is, I wanted to to elaborate a little bit more on that question because in fact it answers two two questions at the same time, and there was another one that. Um, that um, uh, concerned this. Now, the, the, the second question um, about implementing a destination Earth is, uh, does that mean that um, uh, public authorities will now use only their modeling efforts um, and uh, not use external modeling studies? Of course not. This is destination Earth is supposed to provide um, uh, an additional tool, um, a tool that can be tailored to a, a very specific uh, need at a very specific time. So to test, uh, you know, um, uh, the usefulness uh, of, uh, of an adaptation uh, or a mitigation measure uh, in, at any given moment, for example. But that doesn't mean that uh, those uh, modeling studies, for example, published by academia and scientific pa papers, etc., will suddenly become uh, useless uh, or inaccessible uh, for whatever reason to the public authorities. No, these, these uh, destination 
Foundation Earth is meant to complement um, uh, to complement those and basically to be a, a support tool for decision makers. And uh, the last question, uh, or may I say the first, in fact, in terms of timing, if I can just uh, scroll up uh, to read the question uh, again is about um, taking into account human influence um, in in the Earth's uh, digital twin, the full digital twin. So, for example, how land use decision, production decision, economic activity can be incorporated, and is there a plan? Um, uh, or attempts in this direction uh, to exploit the, the huge and increasing availability of social economic uh, uh, geo-reference data. There is, uh, there is in fact, um, uh, that is the plan um, to uh, also include, uh, for example, user-generated data, uh, data coming from um, the Internet of Things as well, uh, different socio-economic data. That is one also of the of the elements um, of innovation in destination Earth uh, to couple, uh, you know, Earth, Earth observation data, geospatial data, environmental data, all that, uh, all that type of data with socio-economic data to provide uh, for better, uh, uh, better modeling for for uh, for more uh, reliable, uh, actionable, trustworthy uh, results. So. It, there is that plan, obviously, uh, it, that gives you also the scale of the ambition of the plan and uh, it, has to be, um, uh, it has to be taken into account and, and we will proceed by stages, but um, uh, the ambition and the objective is definitely to get there uh, with uh, uh, ultimately with a full digital twin of the earth and that obviously takes the, the socio-economic um, uh, aspect into account. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hope this answers. <laughs> it was extremely comprehensive. That was great. Now, I, I also want to say to all of our panelists, when the questions are there in the Q&A at the bottom, um, you are and have the facility to answer the questions directly. So if you want to, we can have multiple lines of questions and answers going on at the same time. Um, what I would like to do now is ask the organisers, let's get a voice from somewhere else. So we, uh, um, in no particular order, we're going to pick, if we can, Richard uh, and see if Richard can ask his question. Um, Richard, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Hello, Paul. Um, yeah, th thanks very much, and, and thanks for a very interesting uh, session. As I as I wrote in the Q and A, I think it's really great to hear from the various DGs and and hear their take on the adaptation strategy and how they'll be uh, engaging in, in its implementation. Uh, of course, there there are a number of other DGs that we haven't heard about or we haven't heard from that that are also going to be relevant. Um, particularly when looking at the systemic approach, which is being prioritized in the uh, EU strategy. So my, my point there is that, that you know, we used to think of, of adaptation very much as a number of sectoral activities where uh, you know, agriculture and water and health and, and biodiversity needed to all do their thing. Uh, but if we take a more systemic approach, that would also mean that DGs would need to work together more closely. Uh, the ones that we've heard about, but also uh, ones that, you know, DG trade, uh, transport and, and so on. What, what sort of challenges and opportunities do you see in creating um, uh, that kind of, of, of coherent policy that is needed? Or, or put differently, how do you make sure that in total you're actually reducing risk rather than um, increasing risk in one place that then needs to be dealt with uh, in, in, the, in the adaptation sphere. Thank you. Um, thank you. Excellent question. I think we might ask it in a slightly different direction. Let's, um, what, Elena, we'll come to you with a question, but would any other DG colleagues like to answer first? I think it's good. I mean, Philippe, I don't know if there's a, a, a respective, oh, Mar Maria, yes, let, let, and, and Alessandra. Okay, this is good. Um, um, but uh, Elena, you're not off the hook yet, just to let you know. Um, so, so yes, please, Maria, you're muted still. Can we? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy to uh, say a few words about this. And I think I alluded to that in my opening statement as well. I think, indeed, uh, this sort of cross-sectoral discussions, the siloization or whatever you call it, has been very much part of the preparation, and I think, uh, of the strategy. And uh, so we have been uh, making links that perhaps were not there between those the departments dealing with public finances and uh, macroeconomic analysis and the, and the emergency response and disaster risk management side before. So uh, indeed, so I think uh, so that that has sort of been 
the way I perceive it, very much part of, of the preparation of the strategy. But of course, it doesn't stop there. We all have our respected networks in the member states. Um, and uh, they don't always talk to each other either. So I think it's all our responsibilities to take these messages to our respective sectoral um, expert groups or networks that we have. And uh, just to, to give this example on the macroeconomic analysis, for instance, that, that we talked about, I mean, we raised these issues in our overview of uh, disaster risks that member states, or that the EU may uh, uh, face. Um, so it's out there, it's being fully discussed within the civil protection and prevention uh, community. And likewise, I believe tomorrow there's going to be the, a chapter in the next um, report on public finances in the EMU that our colleagues are uh, publishing. So I think we all have a responsibility to to within the Commission, but also outside, because we're not working in isolation here in the Commission. So, but I fully agree that this is important and, and that we all have a responsibility for that. Thank you. Uh, Alessandra, did you want to comment as well? Or? Yes, I do. Yes, I do, because I really like this question, because it shows that there is also recommendation for Commission services to work more closely together. And we have a mechanism there, for example, for uh, making policymakers speak with scientists and work together on these policies, which is the steering group of the Knowledge Centre. And colleagues here, Ellen, I sit in there with me, I could chair with, with the DG ECO, uh, RTD is there, and, and that's the place where 12 DGs, including uh, DG ECFIN, which recently asked to join, come together and discuss this, uh, these uh, topics from the different angles of the different polities, uh, policies and it is very true that there are other DGs, many others involved. We have 12 in the steering group and the, the different out, out, uh, angles are brought there and then we try to understand what science can do to face these different angles in the same way with the same answers and, and providing common common answers. And, and I would like to announce something which is a bit of a, a novelty, which maybe I should not do it, but still I do it because <laughs> I like I like this discussion that we are having. That Maria, before she mentioned the, the civil protection mechanism, and she said that the, the enhanced legislation also foresees a knowledge network. Already the civil protection legislation foresees a knowledge network. And in the knowledge network, there is a science pillar, there's a capacity building pillar and the science pillar. And the knowledge, uh, the, the knowledge center, the European Commission Knowledge Center on Disaster Risk Management, uh, will be asked to play an important role there, bringing all the DGs, all the policies, and all the, the research answers together into that pillar, for example, for that policies. And the same we do it for, for, for Elena for the adaptation and for the other policies. So we already work together, and that's Okay, and then maybe just to, uh, 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 you know, just to get your perspective on that cross uh, cross working. Uh, I must say, if uh, if the adaptation strategy was about something was uh, really the co-creation, co-design, and cross DG working. You know, we cannot create a government uh, and uh, society society uh, approach without working with all partners across the you know the commission. Uh, it took off already in 2019, and we have very extensively worked uh, in, in separate groups like the Climate Protection Gap that uh, had a mailing list of over 100 people, and indeed brought uh, together the typically green DGs with uh, DGs uh, responsible for financial affairs or uh, economic affairs, uh, so macroeconomics. We had a you know, group on the land uh, use, uh, forestry, uh, water, uh, etc. So it has been a very intensive work and underneath the strategy we have a very detailed implementation plan that is internal for, for the Commission, where we have, uh, you know, uh, really invited DGs to uh, tell us what they will do uh, with a clear allocation of, uh, you know, leadership. 
uh, of sequencing. So uh, I must say I'm absolutely proud uh, of the working method uh, on the adaptation strategy and this has been a recipe uh, definitely for, for its success and uh, for an adoption by the college and uh, by the recognition of the political masters of its quality, uh, comprehensiveness and, uh, you know, really uh, merits on, on communication. Great, thank you. Okay, um, we're going to go to now, I'm going to just, um, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, what I want to do is get all of the panelists just to have a little think because we might just ask you for a final reflection before we close. So um, maybe particularly the, the people who haven't spoken so much on the questions, we might ask you for a, fa a, a final position. Um, one question that I think um, I'm just going to pick up now because it's right in front of me and I'm multitasking as well. Uh, Clemens, uh, Clemens Hass has, has asked a question about, I think it's quite important, just in terms of how you're planning to measure progress and report to the public. I think that's just a relatively, um, it's, it's quite good to get a process point. Roger Street asked a question that was much more difficult and, and uh, it was a very good question, but I think would take us a little bit longer to answer. So I, I, I think um, that's... Uh, if you can start this question, that's great. And then just to, to warn all the other panelists that um, we, we'll go to some reflections in a few moments uh, just before we end. Yes, sorry, sorry, Elena, just reporting, please. Uh, reporting back. Uh, reporting back, implementation, monitoring success. Uh, it's, it's always, uh, you know, a multi-layer uh, exercise. We are at a strategic level, so as a commission, we will definitely look at, you know, how we will a, B, uh, be able to deploy uh, the activities, the tools, the indicators that we have promised. And this is a decadal strategy. Uh, let, let me stress it uh, like this. This is not an action plan for next year and, and then we are done. So uh, at strategic level, it will very much depend uh, at, uh, on the delivery uh, capacity of, of uh, all of us uh, in, in the Commission. Second, we will, of course, develop together with uh, the, the agency indicators that measure the progress not only in procedural terms, but in outcome terms uh, in, in member states as, as, you know, helping to see whether we have reduced vulnerabilities, we have reduced the risks, we have not created new uh, risks, and, and we have been able to pass these residual risks that uh, we have seen. So, for instance, uh, typically in insurance, uh, the EOPA will uh, deliver a dashboard on the penetration of uh, climate, uh, you know, uh, insurance, uh, insurance against climate risks. And uh, at, you know, some point we will see uh, through the assessment where we stand uh, in member states. Uh, we will, if, if we succeed in the macro fiscal debate, Within the next uh, few years, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Treasury ministries will already look at debt sustainability from the uh, mindset also of the, uh, the, 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 the disaster impacts uh, on it. So it's, it's very multifaceted and I would really uh, would like to caution against, uh, you know, a, a belief that you have one composite indicator that can can, uh, you know, provide you, you with a perfect, uh, you know, uh, result of, of a success or of, of a failure. Really recommend you to read uh, the, the strategy so that you understand the breadth, the depth and the variety of different measures that some of them are really the enabling one, providing a toolbox, and some of them are really the sort of outcome uh, related. Where do we want to get in, 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 in the future, like on the uptake of uh, nature-based solutions or, or really the rollout of demonstrations, uh, deep demonstrations on uh, climate adaptation under the uh, research uh, banner. Um, so uh, very complex way, but we, we, we know where we want to land in 2050 and, and I, I may live around 2050, so I, I, I don't have any excuse of uh, uh, saying that uh, I don't care. 
Good. I think we all hope that we'll be around in 2050. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to, we're, we're almost at the end of the session. There's a few people who haven't answered so, so many questions. So I'm going to ask them for a couple of reflections, but also if we have time from our panelists as well. So Philippe and Lydia, I, I'd like to just um, get a few reflections from you both just to finish off. If I, Lydia, if I can start with you, if there's anything that you want to add on top of the issue around, because, you know, obviously your role in the parliament looking across the commission, I think there's a very important thing there. Or any other um, final reflections that you want to make? Um, just over to you for the floor, please. Um. Thanks, Paul. Yes, uh, I, I would like to, to say um, that uh, we have, uh, in terms of, 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 of strategy, when we look at the involvement of, of the different stakeholders in this process, um, we come to the conclusion that um, we, we have to meet some, some conditions for, for the success of the strategy. And one of them, and one that I've been um, very, that has been in, in, in my um, in, in my political message when addressing uh, the, the, the topics as environment, climate change and, and economy is that we need, um, we, we need uh, a shared vision and a shared strategy. And so we must um, not only, um, we must bring not only the commission and the parliament on the same boat. Uh, we need the member states. We need we need the regions. We need we need the local, the local the local national authorities. We need um, uh, we need everyone uh, because when we say that we don't want to leave anyone behind, anyone also entails uh, the private sector, and so we need the companies and uh, we need investment funds. Uh, to uh, to be able to promote the and to drive this uh, uh, this uh, this this strategy, so we we have to consider the relevant role of uh, universities to be with us as well, uh, the researchers um, promoting innovation, um, and therefore this is why I, I I believe the success of this strategy resides in in sharing a vision. Um, uh, and and sharing the the strategy as a whole. And to to finalize uh, um, uh, as as a as a one last reflection, um, I think it is very important the how we're going to communicate, how we communicate in general, but in particular this usually uh, is more directed to to politicians. But here I think it's it's a, a holistic approach. And so I think we must invest in explaining the strategy and making the Europeans. Um, aware and involved in the climate adaptation risks and what Europe is doing to prevent it. Uh, it is obvious that uh, citizens are aware of the importance of fighting climate change, but they don't know how, what is Europe doing to exactly, concretely to achieve it. And we must push for media coverage, social media awareness, local and national level communication plans uh, on this matter. Um, so this would be my my final um, uh, thought uh, to to deliver uh, a successful strategy uh, and a better future for us all. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Now, um, Philippe, we uh, any reflections? I, we're going to get a session from you tomorrow. I know from your colleagues, but uh, uh, that, we've heard about the research there from from Lydia. Anything you want to add? Yeah, it will be very short because uh, Lydia Pereira said it very well. Although we speak from different angles, she is an MEP and we are uh, in an administration. Uh, she, she talked about the communication uh, and I would like this panel, its compositions seem to give the impression that things come from Brussels, from the EU level, uh, in another sphere, uh, maybe from the same city in, in Brussels, but this is not at all how actually the reality of uh, the development of solutions and their, um, and their deployment is happening. I'm struck when I see the research results that are produced by the dynamism, by the uh, number of uh, experiments that are undertaken, by the mobilization of the communities who are ready to test, engage, participate to the mission, and they call us and they ask the regions, they call us, what can we do? How can you help us? And literally, they are not simply fishing for money. 
This is well known, of course, it's normal, but some are genuinely interested in sharing experience. They don't necessarily need money from the European level, but they want to learn from other regions and peers. And this interconnection between the local communities is a fundamental dim dimension that needs to be strengthened for the success. The solution will not come just from Brussels that would be seen as above between uh, brackets, but by the connection of the multiple solutions av available on the ground. And I tell you, in, in Europe, there are some regions and local communities very, very advanced, much more than in Brussels. Thank you. Now, we have reached the end of the session. I will just give Elena the chance just to see if she wants to respond to any of the issues that were raised, but if not, that's okay as well. Um, uh, and just to close us out, you, you, anything you wanted to respond to any of the panelists from the thoughts and uh, the observations that were made? I think we have heard a lot of very pertinent insights uh, that we would uh, have to digest. Um, I have heard also a very constructive um, criticism uh, where I would really invite everyone to read carefully the adaptation strategy because it's so rich, it's so dense, and a quick scan will not lead you to maybe the term you are always looking for. Uh, so uh, the, the matters of, you know, of, of trade, of open data, of desertification, of social justice, of distributional impact, it's all there. Uh, and as I said, it's just the beginning. We are trying now to get this uh, whole economy, whole society, uh, all businesses strategy uh, to where it needs to be. And I think today's panel is actually showing that uh, the Commission already has uh, this sort of uh, thinking inside uh, its department. And I'm, I'm really pleased uh, colleagues, to be here with you. And I hope uh, we will collectively indeed uh, prove uh, that this is not mission impossible. Uh, this is mission necessary uh, and uh, we will succeed. Thank you ever so much. That's the perfect way to close. Um, the only two things for me left to do are firstly to thank all our panelists. Thank you ever so much. Um, I can't hear people clap, but I'm sure they would be clapping if they could. So that's um, a really strong uh, thanks for that. I found that incredibly um, interesting. And just the final thing is to um, uh, thank Yaroslav, Francesco and Elena from CMCC for uh, getting this all to work and for making it so seamless. And then again, I'd normally ask you all to clap as well. Um, I think it's a fantastic job. It works seamlessly. Uh, and thank you ever so much as well. So that's it for the close. I think there's lots of sessions tomorrow as well. So I'd encourage you if you haven't done that already. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, and good evening. Uh, see you tomorrow, hopefully. Um, thank you, bye.